today's emerging markets, opportunities to venture into international terrain abound. What does it take for a brand to have a global presence? Let's take a look at Pinoy brands making waves beyond Philippine shores. I'm Rod Nepomuceno, and this is Insight. We're talking about uh, local brands um, venturing into international shores. I'll start with you, Eric. How extensive was the expansion then, when, when you were part of San Miguel at the time? And how extensive is it now? They presently have three, uh, three breweries, uh, one in Baoding, one in Guangzhou, and another one in eastern China. They're, they're, they were already uh, in place in, in several markets. The task then was not to uh, uh, were twofold. One is to uh, identify other markets where they can be, and the second one is to expand the consumer base where they are already. And now, Jomag, uh, how extensive is uh, the international presence of Potato Corner? We now we now have 100 stores outside the Philippines. Fantastic. So most of them are in, in Indonesia, actually. Okay. 70 stores, 73 stores in Indonesia, 33 mm -hmm. stores in the U.S. Then one in Panama, Thailand is opening soon, mm -hmm. and Sydney. Well, we're, we're, we're trying, we're raring to go to Africa because we'd like to go to immediately, we'd like to attack the, the, the young retail market, which is to us, it's Africa and French into China. Yeah. Before, before, before the others, the big, the big, the big guys <laughs> want to go there, we want to wanna be there first at least. All right, now when, when did you decide to to uh, expand to the international market. The reason why we went international was not because we wanted to, but because we were forced to. Uh, forced to. In 2003, for example, we got a call from someone in Indonesia. Uh, we'd like to, I'd like to bring potato corner to Indonesia. Uh, we weren't ready for those things. No, she said, this was out of the blue. They yeah, we said no, them. we're not ready. Then 2004, the same person said, "Can we bring?" It was like a, a child always nagging, <laughs> nagging the, the parent to, okay. to do something. And then he, on the third year, we finally said, okay, let's try it. That's, uh, a, that, that's how Definitely the saw, first, something there, no? yeah, saw something th there. That was the first international store in Indonesia. Uh, Eric, in your case, tell us the dynamics uh, involved in, in deciding, okay, we, we go to this particular market. And what are, what are the complexities in a, in a company such as San Miguel? The big thing about beer is that it has to be whenever possible, produce locally. Mm -hmm. Because the, 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 the product is best served or best consumed when it is properly kept. So therefore, as, uh, as an aside, uh, the biggest brand in, in, in the world in beer is the Qingtao, as you know, bigger than the Budweiser's, etc. combined. Mm -hmm. But the way they do it is they have a brewery, small brewery in very specific places so okay. that they can serve the beer. Uh, fresh San Miguel beer. To my mind, it is uh, really an inter a local product that went international and now going global. San Miguel beer is consumed by mainstream people in the countries where they so are. So they position it as sort of like yeah. a local beer. Yes. Uh, well, a foreign beer in their country that is acceptable to their taste. The positioning would be it's like your local beer. Yes, correct. Yeah, position. absolutely. All right. All right. Must okay. be acceptable to mainstream market. I was going to ask how difficult it was. It seemed like in your case, it wasn't that difficult because you were getting, I guess, offers or invitations to really go abroad, right? Rather than you uh, yeah. forcing your way or, or kind of analyzing whether this is a good market or not, it, it really was opportunities coming your way. Right? right. It was us who was reluctant going abroad, really. Uh, the demand was there. But I'd like to add to what Eric said. No? The potato corn is exactly the same way. You know, when we go abroad, we go mainstream right away. Mm -hmm. So we don't, a lot of people say, say when they want to bring, they always say, oh, there's so many Filipinos here, we want to go there. Mm -hmm. Then we just tell them, we're going there only because we're going mainstream. You have to be, potato corn has to be mainstream. So you like don't position it as a Philippine brand. When you go abroad, you don't position it as a Philippine brand. We don't. It's, well, French fries is as mainstream as you can get all over the world. So how do you choose, uh, or go about choosing which market to go first? Is it based on the the offer whether this offer is better or the opportunities that are, are, are probably more ex extensive in this particular market whenever there's a need that's what we do for example uh, we didn't plan to go to the USA but we got a call 2008 I got an email dear mr. Magzaiza I finally found you I studied in international school in the Philippines and now I'm reaching my 30s I've always been dreaming of putting potato corner here in, in California 
can I do this? So I went there and, and met with them. Now we have a joint venture company with 33 stores in, in the oh, USA. So, so definitely, really, uh, people ask me, when is the right time to start franchising or growing the brand? I say, whenever people ask, that's the right time. You better be prepared. That's why we, did, we, don't, we don't benchmark on the right practices. In fact, we're always challenging the status quo. For example, we franchised our second store mm -hmm. because we didn't have enough money to, to yeah. expand. So what, we did, what did we do? We franchised. Mm -hmm. So it was all because of franchising that we're able to grow mm -hmm. globally now. Now, Brad, in, 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 in addition, if I can uh, contribute another avenue of thought, and, and, and I agree with, with Joe Mag, of course, in, in what he stated. Your question is, uh, what, what's the criteria in going to? By examples of bigger companies, uh, I guess it depends on the product category you're in. And let me give you the splash experience. The temptation to go international is very big for any company because of the profit, the market, uh, consumer base increase, profitability, prestige, etc. However, uh, Splash Corporation is a personal care company. The, the strategy was to go for bigger markets. Uh, to my mind, and maybe that was my contribution to the company, is that I totally reverse that. You have to go with less developed country. Because of the product categories, personal care, you cannot find a place where L'Oreal, Unilever is not there. So you have to go to Myanmar, and now they're in Nigeria. And not because these countries are, but it's, the competition is less stiff. If your product is food, like um, our friend Joma, then you can go developed countries, you know. Um, because food is basically, it's, it's basically mainstream. Basic, basic yeah. meat, right? So it all depends on, all the, depends category. on the category. Yeah. That's, that's great. That, that all right. It was a gamble worth taking, but how did this Pinoy brand respond to the challenges of the international market? More when Insight returns. The choice of the partner. That's where many, many businesses would, 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 uh, would make a mistake. Uh, the character, the, the chemistry, and the objective of that partner to me is very, very crucial. It's very important to stick to the DNA that made you successful. So, John Mag, how after you decide to work with, with, with someone from another country, right? you get this invitation, uh, you go there, uh, and you decide you want to work with him, um, how complex is the process after that? Do you do a feasibility study, or you kind of take his word uh, no, it's going to be a hit here. We just want a simple business plan, mm -hmm. and because it's going to be their money, partly our brand, so we just look at the business plan, we validate it, mm -hmm. we go there, also check. Now, is it your business again. plan, or is it their business their plan? Their business plan. All right, and basically, you, you provide the process, yeah. you provide uh, and some the, of the, the assumptions. Supplies, and, uh, some of the assumptions yeah. and, and, and the brand. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe to add to what Joe Mag was saying, let's try and break it down into mm -hmm. uh, stages. The first uh, stage would be the, the choice of the partner. That's where many, many businesses would, 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 uh, would make a mistake. Uh, I agree, I agree. The with character, you. The, the chemistry, and the objective of that partner. The second thing is the regulatory bodies. That's yeah. the hurdle. Mm -hmm. uh, in food, if you go to North America, for example, they're very, very strict on, on, on food regulation. You have to do the FDA, you have to do uh, on a national level or, or on a federal level. Then you have to go to the local, uh, you know, because you have an establishment, you have a specific location, you have to comply. We all know that when you go to another market, there are certain factors in play, you know? factors that sometimes they don't take into consideration when you're doing business here, such as you know, cultural factors. You mentioned earlier religious factors. You know, if you're getting to a Muslim, a predominantly Muslim country, uh, um, co social language barriers and all that. Do you take that into consideration? Depends on the category. If you have alcoholic beverages, of course, you go into a country that's regulating uh, alcohol, then you have to be. But culturally, at the back of your mind, but when you enter a specific country, you already know that. Eh? You already have uh, a sense of what can be acceptable or what cannot be acceptable. Um, some of the mistakes come in when on nomenclature for the brand name, for example. Does it mean, does it have gross negative in another country? Because um, a specific name for your product in this country is all right, but when you go to another country, it means something negative. How important 
is consistency for, for a local brand, a Philippine brand getting into the uh, international market? Is it important to have this one DNA uh, in, in, a, in the brand or is it important to adjust? It is important. You have to stick to what you have. You have to be the standards. If you had already um, established the standards and you want this formulation, it works, it is acceptable, then stay with that. Uh, staying with the brand DNA is very, very important. Um, but more, more than that, I think you have to go back a little and say, hey, um, do I really have a good product? So ultimately, it all boils down to that? It all boils down to having a good product. I'll give you an example. Everybody's familiar with Kikoman. Mm -hmm. Kikoman, if you look at, if you go 10 years back, 15 years back, or maybe 20 years back, you have not encountered a campaign of Kikoman that is global, that is really like, you know, this directed that this is the brand and, and so on and so forth, like Coca-Cola. The, the only secret is that they have a darn good product, and that's that, right? So you, you rely on that. Now, John Mag, in your, in your case, how important is it to keep uh, within the, the potato corner brand DNA, or do you adjust according to uh, the market that you go to? For, for example, if it's Middle East, do you change the fonts? Or do you change the characters of, 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 of your packaging? Or, or you just keep it as is? You know, one thing we did probably right is make sure we, we are what we are mm -hmm. 23 years back. Mm -hmm. The potato corner you have now is still the potato corner you had in, in, in 1992 when we started. And the potato corner that you have in the U.S. is the same it's exactly as the same. you would get in Megamon. Right. So it's very important to stick to the DNA that made you successful. Competition especially local competition. Now you're going to uh, an international market. You're going to the turf of someone else. Now, in your case, Jomag, uh, you even had to deal with that here locally because immediately after you became very successful, there are a lot of other brands who, who tried to copy you and, and somehow failed. Um, exactly. Wherever we go, like we're, we're going to Indonesia, the game plan is always hyper-growth. That's why when we talk to our partner, we say, open your first store mm -hmm. to make it easy for you. But on your second store, go ahead and franchise and sub-franchise right away. So we you, want the numbers to go because you're right. Yeah. There's Eric, a it's, so, it's, so, it's so easy to copy. Everybody can cook French fries, no? Yeah. So, but if you have the numbers and first mover, although we're always the first mover, we're the first mover in Indonesia, first mover in the United States for the, for the kind of product. Mm -hmm. But to my mind, there's no such thing as first mover. It's who dominates the market. Is right. actually perceived as the first mover in the market. Mm -hmm. And so I understand Eric Splash. Better go to an under underdeveloped retail country because you can be the dominant, right, dominant brand there, right? Brand, brand it's right under, away. It's an underserved market. Now, in your case, what, what was the reaction, Eric, when you, when you came into, for example, with First Miguel and as well as Splash? When, when you first uh, introduced your uh, let's say San Miguel beer in Indonesia and the same way for Splash, when you first introduced it to the markets that you went to, what was the initial market reaction? Was it, was it tough? Uh, did you have to build the brand? And if so, how did you build the brand? Well, the, the, the first thing is that when, regardless of which country you go into, the moment you are in that country and you're going to launch a brand, uh, you don't have the thinking that, hey, I come from the Philippines, or hey, I'm global, or hey, you start there. And, and then you, the, you face the same challenges as any other local company would, putting out a new product would be faced with. Like the commercial terms of retailers is very, very stiff. Like you go to Guardian in Indonesia, well, or in Malaysia, or in Singapore, it's going to be tough. They will look at your product, they will see how many SKUs they have now, and then they'll tell you what uh, marketing plans are you So it's not even the product. customer first, meaning the, the retail yeah, yeah. first. It's, yeah. it's first the retailers, the retailers that you have to deal, yeah. deal with. Yeah, because uh, they are key channels to you, to your product, and therefore, uh, even if there's consumer acceptance, if you cannot make your product available, and if you're not ready to pay the price, uh, then it will not be uh, successful. Was there a reaction, though, from, let's say, co potential competitors as, as, as well as the market, you know, seeing it, oh, we can copy this in, in the international market. I know it happened here in the Philippines, but in the international market, was there such a phenomenon as well uh, when they said, oh, this is an interesting concept, Let, let's copy it. You know, surpri surprisingly, not like, like what we had in the Philippines when we had 300 other brands in the first two years. No? But in the U.S., uh, after two years of operations, we saw some groups put up their own flavored fries as well.
and didn't work as well. I, I, it didn't work. <laughs> okay. but, right. but our strategy now in entering the USA and other markets is is to go where where, where super brands like uh, Net Wetzel's Pretzels and all these things is to be beside it. Beside them. That's right. Yeah. All right. What lies ahead for these Pinoy brands? Let's find out when Insight returns. We'll be right back. This is a trait maybe of some, if not many, Filipino companies is to shortcut uh, the, process. the process. You step on big landmines when you do not follow the rules of the host country that you're getting into. What factors would you consider? Uh, if, if you want to consider going out of the country, what are the main factors that you take into account before taking the plunge? You have to be prepared to pay your tuition fee. You cannot have profit in the beginning. You, ha you just have to I, share I, the I cost. agree with you, Eric, on the tuition fee. <laughs> we we're, <laughs> until now, we're still learning going international. That's true. Uh, have, I, you had, have you had some, I guess, uh, hiccups? Ah, a lot. A lot of, until now, we're, we're getting hiccups. We're learning uh -huh. from everything. We're spending a lot. I mean, their lawyers' fees. There's so many fees that you have to pay. Mm -hmm. Each country has different laws in franchising. No, in those cases, different customs, everything. So yeah. in those situations FD, where you an FDA, yeah. you have to right. have the regulatory. Yeah. Exactly. Now in those cases where you had hiccups, when when things didn't pan out the way you wanted them, uh, what were the factors that led to that? Well, it's like in doing business in the Philippines. There, there, are, there's a certain degree of uh, mort mortality. And there are same issues as the Philippines doing business in the Philippines. Mm -hmm. uh, there are only factors you know when you when you start to open. You have to be able to realize early on that you're going to make mistakes. The thing is, avoid landmines. The landmines is the one that you know when it hits you, you're dead, and you know you're in the. What landmines are a perfect example? Yeah. Can you give me an example of a landmine? By um, and this is a trait maybe of some, if not many, Filipino companies, is to shortcut uh, the process. The process. Okay, right. You step on big landmines when you do not follow the rules of the host country that you're getting into. The third and last ingredient, as you say, what other ingredients are you looking at? In my own experience, it's the choice of the right partner. The right partner, uh, as and an that's ex very hard. Yeah, and as, as an expat uh, for quite a number of years, I sp uh, I have the opportunity and the privilege to speak with many other expats coming into the Philippines. Ninety-nine percent of uh, Asian countries, the, the, why the failure is the partner. Um, many in multinational, including San Miguel, made a mistake in China. Um, it's a big, big beverage company, take three in China. San Miguel, maybe take two, take three. <laughs> Finding a partner. Because the partner in the beginning looks nice, says the right words, uh, has the connections, etc. And you get enamored with that. And then after a while, you say, hey, is this for real? Is he for real? Is he as committed? Then things turn sour and go south. Globalization and localization. John Mark, in your case, uh, your Philippine brand now going international. When do you do you have plans to make it uh, a global brand? We're, we consider ourselves global only because the supply chain is already global. Right. So we source from many other countries aside from where the countries we're in now. So definitely we're, we expect to go to maybe three more countries next year. And there's. And whenever you go to different markets, there's no localization. Let's say if it's if in Me Mexico, you don't make it, you don't Mexicanize it, or if you go to Belgium, you don't make it more Belgium or German. Well, we do. We add flavors. We're known. We're known. We're known also by our flavors, our variety of flavors. And definitely, when when our, for example, we go to Indonesia, we have hot, we have very spicy flavor. We go to in the United States, well, we have fried chicken, but fried chicken is our. Our uh, our side dish. So wherever we go, not, French not fries, the main dish. Correct. French fries <laughs> is our main up. dish. So it's 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 a it's a reverse for us. Eric, uh, what would you give uh, as an advice no, to to entrepreneurs out there, or perhaps uh, executives uh, who are working for Philippine companies who want to expand abroad? What, what's the best advice you can give them in terms of your expansion to, to other markets? Well, well, I go back to the simple ingredients. One, you have to have a good product to begin with. If you're not convinced, don't even venture. Mm -hmm. 
Number two, you have to have the commitment to do that because it's a long-term uh, en en uh, engagement. It's not, it's not just a one bam, thank you, mom thing. Number three, you have to really, really screen your partners. You have to get into his personal uh, background. And number four, relax and be cool. You know, not, not, you were, you're going to make a mistake or you're going to make a lot of mistakes. Mm -hmm. Uh, and learn how to pivot. When you encounter a problem, pivot to another side, and that's that, you know, and continue on. Uh, Jomag, what advice would you give uh, to all those entrepreneurs out there who would like to create a brand, a global brand like Potato Corner? Well, I'd like to add to what Eric already contributed, no? Uh, go to the Philippine consulate where you're going, ask for advice, and what are the best, best practices for you to enter. Mm -hmm. They might know a possible partner. They already will give you some advanced information on what not to do and what to do best. Uh, and then get good lawyers. Uh, yeah. Lawyers where you're going to. Don't use your local lawyers. You use your local lawyers for your, for, for your contracts here, but when you're going to another country, use their, the lawyers there, the experts there. Uh, it's an investment. It's and going to cost and don't you. be cheap about the lawyer. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> it's, 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 so consider it, a, consider it as lawyer, an investment, right? not an expense. Right. Because it will it'll pay dividends in the future. All right. And that's our program for tonight. This is Insight, the program that tackles the latest developments in the dynamic world of marketing. I'm Ron Pumuseno. Good night. God bless. See you again next week.